listening. <laughs> Great. Okay, we should go on mute. <clears throat> All right, we're on YouTube now. Um, you want to wait a few more minutes, Rabbi, and see if we get a few more stragglers. Okay. Then everybody else, why don't you everybody please mute yourself and uh, turn off your videos. <clears throat> Till five after Rabbi, and then we'll go. Okay. okay. <clears throat> right back. I think we're probably ready to go, Rabbi. Go okay. Great. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our third adult education session of this year. It's great to have all of you with us. Um, I, I teach this course tonight um, on Mashiach, the Messiah, the Anointed One, with a couple of, of codicils. One is, um, I teach it because I think it's something important to know about as Jews. Um, the, the difficulty in teaching about Mashiach or the Messiah to a, a, a liberal reform Jewish community is, is, first of all, uh, Reform Judaism does not affirm the traditional concept of Mashiach. I mean, there's a very different view of what Mashiach is, which I'll go into later, but um, uh, it's, it's not the traditional view of a Messiah coming at an appointed time. And the third trepidation that I have about teaching a course is that in order to really understand the concept of Mashiach, which is the Hebrew word for Messiah, it requires a, a great degree of belief. Now, you'll notice I said in order to understand the concept of the Messiah, it requires belief. It's, it's not, I'm not saying that in order to accept the Messiah, it requires belief, which, which it does. But some of the things that I'm going to say tonight, if you're not a true believer in the traditionalist sense of the word, some of it may not make a great deal of sense to you and thereby will provoke 
a fair number of questions at the end. So having said that, um, let me begin by saying that the closest I think that anyone has ever come to creating a widely accepted list of Jewish beliefs is Maimonides' 13 Principles of Faith. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Maimonides or heard of his Principles of Faith, <coughs> but these principles are the 13 things that Rambam, Maimonides thought, were the minimum requirement of Jewish belief. And let me just, let me just tick them off quickly. First, God exists. Second, God is one and unique. Third, God is incorporeal. In other words, God is non-material, but existing. Fourth, God is eternal. Fifth, prayer is to be directed to God alone and to no other. Sixth, the words of the prophets are true. Seven, Moses' prophecies are true. And Moses was the greatest of the prophets. Eight, the Torah, in other words, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the oral Torah, the teachings that are now contained within the Talmud and other writings, those were literally given to Moses. Nine, there will be no other Torah. Ten, God knows the thoughts and the deeds of humans. Eleven, God will reward the good and punish the wicked. Twelve, the Messiah will come. Thirteen, the dead will be resurrected. Now, these are Maimonides' 13 articles of faith. These are the bottom line principles that Maimonides put forth, who said that this is what a Jew must believe in order to be a Jew. And as you can probably see, many of these 13 principles of faith are based on exactly that. They're based on faith. They're very basic and general principles. And yet as basic as these principles are, the necessity of believing each one of these has been disputed at one time or another. And liberal Judaism or liberal movements of Judaism dispute many of those 13 principles. But unlike many other religions, Judaism does not focus much on abstract cosmological concepts. Jews have certainly considered the nature of God and the nature of man, the universe, life, afterlife at great length. All you have to do is look at Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism to see that. But there is no mandated official definitive belief on any of these subjects outside of the very general 13 principles that I gave you earlier. There's substantial room for personal opinion on pretty much all of these matters. And the reason for that is that Judaism is much more concerned 
about actions than it is about beliefs. Judaism always focuses on relationships, the relationship between God and humanity, the relationship between God and the Jewish people, the relationship between the Jewish people and the land of Israel, the relationship from human being to human being. Our scripture tells the story of the development of all of these relationships from the time of creation through the creation of the relationship between God and Abraham to the relationship between God and the Jewish people and forward. Jewish scripture also specifies the mutual obligations that are created by these relationships. Although various movements of Judaism disagree about the nature of these obligations. Some say these obligations are absolute, unchanging laws of God from God. That would be the orthodox or the traditional point of view. Some say they are laws from God that change and evolve over time. And you can find that very much within the workings of the conservative movement. Some say that these are nothing more than guidelines. Excuse me, shut my phone off. Some say that these are nothing more than guidelines that you can choose whether or not to follow. And of course you would get that from the reform movement, the progressive movement, the reconstructionist movement. And if you want to learn more about that, you can certainly look up things like movements of Judaism, and you'd get a whole variety of ideas. So what are the actions that Judaism is so concerned about? Well, according to Orthodox Judaism, these actions include the 613 commandments, mitzvot, given by God in the Torah, as well as the laws instituted by the rabbis, and long-standing customs. Now, we're not going to discuss these in detail, but again, if you want more information, all you have to do is look up the word halakha, or Jewish law, and it will give you an entire compendium of what Jewish law says about whatever subject you are concerned. So let me go back for a moment to Rambam, to Maimonides. Maimonides, in his 13 principles of faith, says, we believe in the Messiah. We believe in Mashiach. The exact words or the exact statement that he makes in the 13 principles of faith is, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, and though he may tarry, still I await him every day. If you've ever sung the song, Anima Amin, Anima Amin, Anima Amin, that's this principle of Maimonides' faith about the Mashiach. So if you've ever sung that, that's exactly what you've been saying when you sing those words. Belief in the eventual coming of a Mashiach, of a messianic figure, is a basic and fundamental part 
of traditional Judaism. In the Shmona Esrei, in the Amidah, you might not call it as the Amidah, or you might call it the, the Shmona Esrei, the 18 benedictions, or you might call it simply Hatfilah. In that prayer that we recite three times every day, we find and we pray for all of the elements of the coming of the Messiah. And therein lies the answer to the question, how come reformed Jews don't pray the entire Amidah? They only pray parts of it because some of it reflects a prayer in the coming of the Messiah. It reflects the idea of the ingathering of the exiles. It reflects the idea of the restoration of the religious courts of justice. They reflect the idea of an end to wickedness, an end to sin, an end to heresy. It prays for the reward for the righteous, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the restoration of the line of King David, and the restoration of the temple service. Now, many of these things we do not hope for or look forward to in Reform Judaism. Modern scholars suggest that the messianic concept was introduced later in the history of Judaism, actually during the age of the prophets. They note that the messianic concept is not explicitly mentioned anywhere in the Torah. And in reality, if you look for the word Messiah or Mashiach, in the entire five books of Moses, you won't find it. It's not there. However, and here's where belief comes in. Traditional Judaism maintains that the messianic idea has always been a part of Judaism. The Mashiach is, as I said, not explicitly mentioned in the Torah, because the Torah was written in terms that all people could understand. And the abstract concept of a distant spiritual future reward was beyond the comprehension, it was thought, of many common people. However, the Torah does contain <clears throat> references to terminology like acharit hayamim, the end of days, which is the time of the Messiah. So the concept of Mashiach was known in the most ancient of times, even though it may not have specifically been spelled out in the Torah itself. The term Mashiach literally means the anointed one. And it refers to the ancient practice of anointing kings with oil when they took the throne. The Mashiach is the one who will be anointed as king in the end of days. The word Mashiach let me clarify something for all of you right now. <clears throat> it does not mean savior. The notion of an innocent, divine, or semi-divine being who will sacrifice himself to save us from the consequences of our own sins is a purely Christian concept. It has absolutely no basis in Jewish thought. Unfortunately, this Christian idea 
has become so ingrained, so deeply ingrained in the word Messiah that this English word can no longer be used to refer to the Jewish concept. The word Mashiach is the word that we use in Judaism to describe the anointed one. We no longer use the, the word in English, Messiah. There are non-Jews who have said that the term Mashiach is related to the Hebrew term savior because they sound similar. One is Mashiach, one is Moshiach. Moshiach is savior. But the similarity is not as strong as it appears to someone who's unfamiliar with Hebrew. The Hebrew word Mashiach comes from the root Mem Shin, shin Chet, which means to paint or smear or anoint. The word Moshiach comes from the root Yud Shin Ayin, which means to help or save. So in Hebrew, they are two completely different words coming from two completely different roots. The only letter these roots have in common is the Shin, which is the most common letter in the Hebrew language. The M sound at the beginning of the word Moshiach, Savior, is a common prefix that's used to turn a verb into a noun. For example, the verb tsava, to command, becomes mitzvah, commandment. Saying that Mashiach is related to Moshiach is sort of like saying that ring is related to surfing because they both end in ing. The Mashiach from a traditional Jewish point of view, will be a great political leader descended from King David. How do I know that? Because it's spoken that way in the book of Jeremiah. The Mashiach is often referred to as Mashiach ben David, Mashiach the son of David. He'll be well-versed in Jewish law. He'll be observant of its commandments. We get that from the book of Isaiah. He'll be a charismatic leader, inspiring others to follow his example. He'll be a great military leader who will win battles for Israel. He will, be, he will be a great judge who will make righteous decisions, again, according to the book of Jeremiah. But above all, and this is the thing I want you to remember about Mashiach, is he will be a human being, not a god, not a demigod, nor will he be a supernatural being. It has been said that in every generation, a person is born with the potential to be the Mashiach. If the time is right for the Mashiach or the Messianic age within a person's lifetime, then that person will be the Mashiach. But if that person dies before he completes his mission, the mission of the Mashiach, then that person was never the Mashiach to begin with. You may have heard of the concept of Lamed Vav. Lamed Vav in Hebrew are the letters, Lamed is 30, Vav is 6, that in every generation there are 36 righteous souls that hold up the world, or the world exists because of their efforts. It has been said 
then in every generation, it's thought that perhaps one of these 36 righteous beings perhaps may be the Messiah. But of course, we never know who those 36 righteous beings really are. There are a wide variety of opinions on the subject of when the Mashiach will come. Some of Judaism's greatest minds have cursed those who've tried to predict the time of the Mashiach's coming because errors in those kinds of predictions cause, could cause people to lose faith in the messianic idea or even in Judaism itself. This actually happened in the 17th century when a man by the name of Shabbatai Tzvi claimed that he was the Messiah. During his lifetime, Shabbatai Tzvi converted to Islam under the threat of death. And many Jews were so taken with him as the Messiah, they converted with him. But nevertheless, this prohibition has not stopped anyone from speculating about the time when the Messiah will come. If you want to read about a really interesting aspect of Jewish history, read about the life of Shabbatai Tzvi. There are some scholars who believe that God has set aside a specific date for the coming of the Mashiach. Most authorities suggest that the conduct of humanity will determine the time of the Mashiach's coming. In general, it's believed that the Mashiach will come in a time when he is needed most because the world is so sinful, or in a time when he's most deserved, because the world would be so good. For example, each of the following has been suggested as a time when the Mashiach will come. If all of Israel repented on a single day, that would be enough to bring the Messiah. If Israel observed, if all of Israel, all Jews, observed two consecutive Shabbats in a row as traditional Shabbats, that would be enough to bring the Messiah. In a generation that is totally innocent or guilty, the Messiah would come. In a generation that loses hope, the Messiah would come. In a generation where, to where children are totally disrespectful towards their parents and their elders, that would be enough to bring the Mashiach into the world. Before the time of the Mashiach, there will be war and suffering. That comes from the 38th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. The Mashiach will bring about the political and spiritual redemption of the Jewish people by bringing us back to Israel and restoring Jerusalem. Now that's reaffirmed in a number of different books in the Bible, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea. He will establish a government in Israel that will be the center of all world government, both for Jews and non-Jews, from the book of Isaiah. He will build the temple and reestablish its worship from the book of Jeremiah. He will restore the religious court system of Israel and establish Jewish law as the law of the land. Again, from the book of Jeremiah. The world 
after the Messiah comes is often referred to in Jewish literature as Olam Haba. It's a good term to remember. Olam Haba literally means the world to come. Now that term can cause some confusion because it's also used to refer to a spiritual afterlife. In English, we commonly use the term messianic age to refer specifically to the time of the Mashiach. Olam Abba will be characterized by peaceful coexistence of all people from Isaiah, hatred, intolerance, and war will cease to exist. There are some authorities who suggest that the law of nature will change so that the predatory beasts will no longer seek prey and agriculture will bring forth a supernatural abundance, again, from the book of Isaiah. Others, however, say that these statements are merely an allegory for peace and prosperity. All of the Jewish people, when the Mashiach comes, will return from their exile among the nations to their home in Israel. Again, from the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea. And just let me give you a sidebar to this. That's why so many Haredim are so insistent that Israel be known as the Jewish homeland, because it's the place that all of the exiles will come home to after Mashiach makes an appearance. The law of the Jubilee will be reinstated. If you don't know what the Jubilee is, the Jewish year is based on something called a sabbatical year. Every seventh year, the fields in Israel all lie fallow. In other words, every seventh year, every field is given a rest. Just like on Shabbat, we are given a rest. That takes place every seventh year. In Israel, it's done, and it's one of the qualifications for food products to be considered kosher, that the the person who's growing these products lets the fields rest every seventh year. If that doesn't happen, that's one of the distinctions that can make food not kosher. Seven sevens makes 49 years, a cycle of 49 years. On the 50th year, that year in the Bible is called Hayovel, the Jubilee. In the Jubilee, all things go back to the way they started. In other words, all land is returned to its original owners. All fields lie fallow. Nothing is produced that year. All prisoners are able to go free. Um, All slaves, anyone who is enslaved in any way is given their freedom during Yovel, during the 50th year. So one of the things that the Messiah is supposed to reinstate is this Yovel, is this 50th year celebration. In the Olam Haba, in that world to come, the world of the Messiah, it's said that the whole world will recognize the Jewish God as the only true God and the Jewish religion as the only true religion. Again, from Isaiah, from Micah, 
and from Zechariah. There'll be no murder, no robbery, no competition, no jealousy. There'll be no sin from the book of Zephaniah. Sacrifices will continue to be brought to the temple. Remember, the Mashiach is going to reinstate the temple cult and the temple worship. But these will be limited only to thanksgiving offerings, offerings of our giving thanks to God for what we have. There'll be no further need for expiatory offerings. In other words, there'll be no further need for sin offerings or guilt offerings or free will offerings or heave offerings, which were given during the time of the temple. Because none of those things will continue to exist, Bimot HaMashiach, in the days of the Messiah. Now, there are, there are other things that are supposed to take place during the Messiah or the Messianic reign, but those are mostly the highlights of what will come, of what will come to be. And you can readily see some of the reasons why liberal Judaism, Reform Judaism, Progressive Judaism, Conservative Judaism, in some degree, to some degrees, Reconstructionist Judaism, um, rejects this whole idea of the coming of a physical Messiah, because none of these groups have any desire to go back to the way things were done during the times of the temple in Jerusalem. Just because a third temple may be resurrected, it doesn't necessarily mean from a liberal point of view that we need to do all of the things that were done back then. In other words, it doesn't have to literally take place the way it took place so many hundreds and thousands of years ago. Now, Jews do not believe that Jesus was Mashiach. Assuming that Christian scripture is accurate in describing him, Jesus simply did not fulfill the mission of the Mashiach as it's described in the biblical passages that I've cited. Jesus didn't do any of the things that the scripture said the Messiah is going to do. On the contrary, another Jew born about a century later came far closer to fulfilling the messianic ideal than Jesus did. His name was Simeon ben Kosiba. He was known as Bar Kokhba, literally means son of a star. He was a charismatic, brilliant, but brutal warlord. Rabbi Akiba, one of the greatest scholars in Jewish history, believed that Bar Kokhba was Mashiach. Bar Kokhba fought a war against the Roman Empire, catching the 10th Legion by surprise and retaking Jerusalem. He resumed sacrifices at the site of the temple, and he made plans to rebuild the temple. He established a provisional government, and he began to issue coins in this government's name. This is what the Jewish people were looking for in a, in a Mashiach. Jesus never clearly fits into this mold. Ultimately, however, the Roman Empire did crush the revolt and they killed Bar Kokhba. And after his death, everyone acknowledged that he was not Mashiach. 
throughout Jewish history, there have been many people who have claimed to be the Mashiach or whose followers have claimed that they were Mashiach. Bar Kokhba, Shabbatai Tzvi, Jesus, others that are too numerous to mention by name. Um, Leo Ralston reports some very entertaining accounts under the entry for Mashiach in the new joys of Yiddish. But all of these people died without fulfilling the mission of Mashiach. Therefore, none of them is considered to be Mashiach. The Mashiach and the Olam Haba lie in the future, not in the past. Um, and I just, I wanted to give you sort of uh, just a, a, a quick overview of the image of the Messiah in Judaism and, and Christianity. Um, the Mashiach in Judaism was, of course, a significant figure with the characteristics of a priest and a king who will change the world, order, not just change the world, but change the world order in accordance with the will of God. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God as the waters covered the sea. Of course, all of that is from the book of Isaiah, and all of that describes Bimot HaMashiach, the days of the, of the Mashiach, the days of the Messiah. Quick, a, a quick recap of some of the characteristics of the Jewish Messiah. He'll be a servant of God. From Again, from Isaiah, behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Secondly, he will build the kingdom of God. He shall build a house for my name from the second book of Samuel. He will be a national hero who will vanquish the enemies of Israel. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely from Jeremiah. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. Again, from the second book of Samuel. His kingdom will be eternal, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, from Samuel. He will have wonderful abilities, and the spirit of Lord, the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, from Isaiah. He will engage in acts of moral judgment, but with the righteousness he shall judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Again, from Isaiah. He will be a light unto the nations. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant to the people, for a light to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house again from Isaiah. And I can go on and on and on 
but please remember that the Jewish Mashiach is selected by God to be the Mashiach in the world. In Christian doctrine, Jesus is identified as the Messiah, is called the Christ, which is from the Greek for Messiah. In the New Testament, Jesus is called Messiah on several occasions. According to the Gospel of Mark, begins with the sentence, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Gospel according to Matthew identifies Jesus as the Messiah and even as the Son of God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This statement expresses the belief that Jesus, as the Son of God, possesses divine attributes. In the Gospel according to Mark, Jesus admits to the high priests that he is the Messiah. Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus says, I am, in the book of Mark. Aside from the statements in the New Testament, regarding Jesus being the Messiah, the actions that are described in the story of his life and death, Jesus does indeed show the characteristics of the Messiah as understood in Judaism. He acts in the name of God. The spirit of the God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears from the book of Luke. He will establish the kingdom of God forever, the kingdom of heaven. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the book of Matthew. He has wonderful abilities that enable him to perform miracles, including raising the dead. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. The book of Matthew. He is presented as pursuing peace and opposing violence. From the book of Matthew, I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other one also. But despite the similarity in the concepts there are basic differences in the concept of the Messiah and the concept of Mashiach. In Judaism, Mashiach is flesh and blood. Even though the Tanakh states that God will be a father to him and he will be a son to God, I will be his father and he shall be my son. In the second book of Samuel, the meaning of this verse is looked upon by the rabbis as symbolic. The Messiah will enjoy the benevolence of God as a son enjoys the benevolence of his father. In Catholicism, the Messiah is the son of God while also being mortal. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came? Who is over all God blessed forever from the book of Romans? Contrary to common belief in Judaism, that the Messiah has yet to come, in Christianity, the Messiah has already arrived. I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will teach us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I shall speak unto thee, am he, from the book of John. He will return at the end of days. According to the Christian concept, if Israel sinned by refusing to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. From the book of Galatians, if they recognize his messianism, they shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, 
thou shalt be saved from the book of the Romans. Now, one other thing that I think I need to mention, and then I'm sure many of you have questions, and that is the notion that a cemetery is called a Beit Olam, a Beit Olam. A Beit Olam literally means a house of life. And the reason it's called a house of life is because when the Messiah arrives, when the Messiah comes, one of the things that he is to do is he will restore the dead to life once again, but not to the life that we knew beforehand, to some other form of temporal existence, not that we would sit and remember all of our loved ones and what we had for dinner the night before. That's not the kind of life that that Judaism believes Mashiach will restore the dead to. Remember what I said at the beginning, that in order to truly believe in Mashiach, and it is a belief system, one needs to accept the notion that the dead will live again, all of the dead will rise again. And that's one of the reasons in Judaism, in traditional Judaism, why we don't embalm and we don't make any unnecessary cuts to the body and we don't make any unnecessary marks to the body because that body will be revived once again in another life when this Messiah arrives. Um, questions? You have any questions? Okay. Watch, watch the camera. Anybody? I have a question, yeah. Rabbi. Um, my, have my own. Yeah. yeah. My question. My question is this. Um, so, why why do the evangelical people want to see um, want to see the Messiah um, in Israel? But they they want to hasten. The, the end of days, and they believe that all of this has, all of these various things have to happen for the Messiah to come. But that's, they're not talking about a Jewish Messiah. They're talking about Jesus coming back again. Is that right? No, they're actually talking about the Hebrew version of the Messiah. Okay. Who's but supposed to, who is supposed to arrive in Israel coming through the Golden Gate. In the, in the old city of Jerusalem. Um, they're looking forward to a time when they're, 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 I mean, one of the reasons why evangelical Christians are so pro-Israel or pro-Jewish homeland is because they believe literally in what the Bible says. They don't only look at the Old Testament, they look at the New Testament. And they believe in the literal meaning of the words in many of the prophets that the, that when that when the Messiah comes, he will restore all the uh, dispersed Jews throughout the world back to Israel to a homeland. Okay, but do they do they also think that? Um... The, the anointed one will be um, in charge of all of the peoples of the world and that the only religion that will be practiced will be Judaism? No, it will be Christianity. Oh, well, so that, I mean, that conflicts with, with that part of the story. Yeah, yeah, it can, it, it, it's not, it's not, the, I mean, but they're, they want the Messiah to come. I mean, they're looking forward to having the Messiah, this, this, um, Mashiach 
come because they know it will be the end of these days and usher in a new time period for the world. Okay, and the entire world will be living under the kingship of God. That's what they're looking for, for everybody to be living under the kingship of God, where everyone is a believer in God. And what is the second coming of Christ? The second coming of Christ is what the what the New Testament speaks of when uh, when Jesus will return, Jesus will come back. That's the second coming. That's the se he came to earth once. He was the son of God. He was killed. He was buried. He rose on the third day after his burial, and he will return to earth. That will be as the Messiah. Coming. As as a Messiah, yes, as a Messiah, not as Mashiach though. You have to you have to separate those terms. Mashiach is the the what the Scripture talks about in terms of an actual chosen individual who comes back to earth. The reason it can't be Jesus is Jesus is kind of a demigod or God, godlike or spiritual. This is going to be in the form of a person, a human being. Jesus appeared as a human being, but was God or was considered God. Hmm. Was he considered God in his day or after he was killed? <clears throat> He was Absolutely. considered God about 200 years after he died. No, no. There's another question. He was never considered. He was never considered the Messiah while he lived. Never, not by anybody. There's another not, question. Not by the resurrection of or by anybody else. Okay. Another question uh, dealing with the resurrection of the dead. <clears throat> and you just mentioned there should be no cuts, no embalming, etc. Does that mean that Judaism prohibits donation of organs? <clears throat> traditional Judaism, <clears throat> excuse me, traditional Judaism does prohibit donation of organs. Yes. Yes. What about what, what's what traditional about Judaism? Judaism? What? Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism. What is Reform Judaism? What is reform, Judaism? reform Judaism affirms donation of organs. It does not, it does not take it literally. They, they, Reform Judaism is of the firm conviction that if you can, if you indeed can help save another, save another person's life under the codicil of Pikuach Nefesh in matters of life and death, and death, you do everything you can to save a life. Okay. So that's, Thank you. that's how... That's how Reform Judaism um, explains the do the donation of organs. Uh, Richard Richard Goldstein has a question. Uh, uh, about oh, 50 years ago, I read a book called The Passover Plot. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember, I think they even made a movie on it. It was written by a Jewish man named Schoenfeld, but it talked about how the disciples really made it look like um, that Jesus was the Messiah at, at that point to the people. And fulfilled many of the, the predictions. Of course, it came from the, the, the right line of descendancy. But of course, we don't accept it um, because, as you said, the tasks weren't the same. He didn't fulfill all of those. The, the Passover, the Passover plot was um, was uh, I won't say great. I'll say interesting fiction. Mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting reading. I mean. I was captivated when I read it, um, but but as as you study other other tractates and other treaties and other dynamics of Judaism, you learn that that in 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 no way number one did Jesus proclaim himself to be the Messiah, nor nor did he ever fulfill any of the real qualifications that the Messiah was to fulfill. Um, 
but it was i mean i i i urge people to read the book it was a it was it was i i was captivated by the, by the by the by the book and then then i actually um i took a course in new testament and um it, in rabbinical school and um it sort of yanked the planks out of the foundation of the passover plot when when i actually learned uh what the meaning behind some of the new testament statements were and where they came from and who spoke them perhaps fran has a question but you have to unmute yourself fran unmute yourself how what? Right. Go ahead. Uh, how does Allah and Muhammad fit into this scheme? Um, Allah, Allah, and um, Allah and Muhammad fit into the scheme um, in the following in the following way. Um, the word Messiah, which which in the in the, um, uh, the, the Muslim, in the Muslim Bible, is spelled M A S I H, Messiah. Um, it's found, if I'm not mistaken, eleven times in the Quran. Um, it's often connected with the name of Isa which is the Muslim name for Jesus, the son of Miriam. Uh, and the statement, the statement in the Quran says he was only a messenger and his name was Al-Messiah, um, the son of Mar Miriam. Um, uh, he shall become known as Christ Jesus. Now, now we all know that uh, the, the Islam used Jesus just as they used Moses as one of the prophets of of Islam. Um, in in um, in two thousand and one, the former Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia issued a religious decree or a fatwa as a response to the question, why is Isa, uh, Jesus, the son of Miriam, called Al-Messiah? And his response, I think, encapsulates the ideas of a number of Muslim commentators before him. This is what he said, and I'll read it verbatim from the fatwa. Isa, the son of Miriam, is called a Messiah because he did not touch any sick or disabled person except that they were cured by Allah's permission. Some of the Salaf, in other words, some of the, um, the, um, the wise people, also said that he was called al-Messiah due to his contact with the earth and his frequent traveling and the propagation of the earth of the religion. And according to these two sayings, al-Messiah, meaning Messiah, one who, one who touches. It's also said that he is al-Messiah because his feet were flat, with no hollow. Because what? His feet were flat, feet flat. Because of the soles of his feet, and he said that he was touched with blessing or that he was purified from sin and was therefore blessed. And in these cases, Al Messiah would mean Mamsua, which means one who is touched. But the first meaning is the most appropriate and Allah knows best. In any case, there is no connection between this and the belief or action and the benefit of knowing it is minimal. And the last statement of the Mufti is important. The benefit of knowing about this person called Messiah for Muslims is minimal. Okay, so for Muslims, the concept of Messiah 
is there, but it's not nearly as important as the concept of Allah. Okay, the concept exists in the Quran, but it's not nearly as important as um, as 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 Allah, what Allah does, what Allah says, and there is no notion in the Quran that there's going to be a person who's coming back to earth at a time when there's perfection that reigns or perfection exists. So that Jewish slash Christian, actually slash Buddhist slash Chinese concept of Messiah, Mashiach, does not really exist within Islam. Muhammad said, what's his role? What is Muhammad's role? Muhammad is the is a spokesperson for Allah. He is the spokesperson. He is the prophet of all. He is Allah's prophet. And the same responsibility of Jewish prophets in the Bible, that's exactly what what Muhammad does in the Quran. Thank you. Sure. Earl? Two questions, Rabbi. The first one is, you know, in reform, we don't believe in a physical Messiah coming back. Right. Just, I mean, it, it just doesn't exist because it's the idea that we all will bring about a perfect world working together. Right. Hopefully, someday. Right. Um, actually, the I'm the in the days of the Messiah, yes. Yeah. I don't exactly have a question on that, but the, que the question, really one question is, based on what you're saying of the criteria for Mashiach, how is it that the Chabad said that the Lubavitcher Rebbe was a Mashiach? Well, because the Lubavitcher Rebbe, while he was living, when he was alive, fulfilled some of the criteria that that belong to the Messiah. Um, um, he never married. He had never been to Israel. Um, he was an exceedingly wise and patient human being. I mean, he had a lot of the he had a lot of the criteria. And the the thought was that after he died, he would come back as Mashiach. In other words, what the Lubavitcher, what the Lubavitcher Hasidim were doing was they were holding him up as an example of what the Messiah would be like, of what some of the qualification. I mean, he already had some of the qualifications of of um, of being the Messiah. So they sort of they sort of gravitated to him as being the Messiah more so after he died than when he lived. Um, but he hasn't come back, uh, at least not yet. <laughs> the other thing, Charles, the other thing that I just want to I want to jump in on is in, in Reform Judaism, liberal Judaism, progressive Judaism, we don't talk about Messiah as a person. We liberal Judaism looks at Messiah or Mashiach as a time period, as an age, okay, as a as a as a, a, a period of time when all of these um, dreams, so to speak, of a perfect world, of everybody being nice, of ridding the world of sin, of everyone celebrating Shabbat and holiday, you know, we 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 look at that as a period of time not as not as a person okay we don't see that as as a we're not waiting for a person and again what i said earlier in my talk i mean also for the messiah and that is that that um we don't we don't we don't um laud human beings okay it's it's our actions 
that are the things that count. It's what we it's what we do that counts. And it's what we do and what we do together will bring about that will bring about this period of time. It's not going to reform Judaism doesn't see it, it, it arbitrarily as some man walking through the Golden Gate and ushering in this special time. That's not what reform Judaism or liberal Judaism is all about or what reform Judaism or liberal Judaism hopes for. But again, if you if you if you think about what I said at the beginning, if you're going to believe in Mashiach as a human being, it's predicated first and foremost on belief, on a belief system. Okay? You must have this belief system. It must come from this mindset that you believe in this system the way traditional Judaism has it play itself out. Um, otherwise, Mashiach, like for reform and liberal Judaism, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make it doesn't make sense to us. Wasn't it the Muslims that uh blocked up the golden gate so the messiah wouldn't come yes yes but but we know that we know that that uh um the messiah will come through that gate and that's how we'll know that's the messiah even <laughs> though it's even though not only is it blocked up it's cinder blocked up oh and i know cemented and cemented i mean they're solid walls but but we believe that or the traditional Jews believe that that will not impede the coming of the Messiah when the time is right for Mashiach to make an appearance. Mashiach will make an appearance. Rabbi, is one of the Steve has a question. Is one of the requirements uh, that the Mashiach be a male. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. One of the requirements is that uh -huh. Mashiach will be will be ma unfortunately, yes. One of okay. the one of the requirements is that Mashiach will be male. In 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 no sources that I have ever searched out does it ever mention the possibility, even the glim possibility of Mashiach being a female. It I will, guess we it have will, to rewrite these things. <laughs> what? I, I didn't hear I what you said. I think we have to rewrite some of these, well, these papers. <laughs> well, that's part, of, part of, that's part of why Reform Judaism or Liberal Judaism doesn't accept it. Because remember, Reform and Liberal Judaism look at men and women as the same. Um, there's no difference. Between Scott, Silver, Scott Silver has a question. Mm -hmm. Scott uh, has Rabbi, a question. It, question about the, the Christian beliefs about the Messiah. If, if God sent his only son, Jesus, to earth as the Messiah to welcome in the Messianic age, but the world wasn't ready, doesn't that cast doubt on God's judgment? And secondly, how do rational, intelligent Christians accept the whole concept of the Trinity, a virgin birth, uh, and the fact that the Messiah came to earth, but in fact did not usher in the Messianic age. Well, it, 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 again, if you're looking at, when, when you say Christians, you know, there, the Christianity like Judaism runs the entire spectrum from very liberal to very traditional. And it, number one, it depends on which group you're talking to. Uh, and number two, it doesn't cast it doesn't cast judgment necessarily on God. Um, remember the the early writers of the Gospels, okay, who who made these proclamations were were um, what I'm going to call Hebrew Christians, okay. These individuals were people who were disaffected with Judaism. They were disaffected 
with the rabbinate. They were disaffected with what was going on at the temple. They were looking for something else. They were looking for another path. So when they wrote some of these things, they knew what they were doing when they when they wrote it in in uh, direct opposition to what the Jewish view of the Messiah was was all about. They were trying to produce, they were trying to create a new religion. But remember, all of this happens about two centuries after Jesus dies. Okay, none of it is contemporaneous. None of the statements of the New Testament are contemporaneous with Jesus's life. Nothing, none of them. The, the earliest gospel, the earliest gospel, the gospel of, of Matthew, um, came out anywhere from 70 to 90 years after Jesus's death. Okay, so any close to a century, none of this took place till at least close to a century after after Jesus's death. The last gospel, the gospel of John, came came out about 150, 160 years after Jesus' death. And it wasn't compiled into what, what you know to be called the New Testament till a little after 200 CE. So that is, that's two centuries after Jesus, Jesus died. So most of what you have, the vast majority of what you have in the New Testament, okay, is written by disaffected Jews who were leaving Judaism trying to create a new faith. Okay, and that's why you have the, the, the variety of differences and, and some similarities between Judaism and Christianity. They wrote what they knew. They knew Judaism, but they needed to change it enough so that it was vastly different from what rabbinic Judaism was because it wasn't fulfilling their needs. Hopefully that answers your question. What about the scientific explanation of at the time of Jesus and or what they described two centuries later? Well, the scientific explanation, I mean, the Shroud of Turin, that scientific explanation? No, about the virgin birth and God's having a son and, and that aspect of this discussion. Um, when you say when you say what what do I think about it? I, I think it's I think it's it's creating creating rational understanding to irrational logic. I think it's trying to it's it's trying to it's doing the best they can to put square pegs in round holes. I think I think that's what they're doing when they talk about the science. I mean, I, I'm not sh when you say scientific explanation, I'm not I'm not I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, except that when you talk about virgin birth, when when I mean a, a, a common term that was used in Judaism when a woman had a first child that was often talked about as a virgin birth. Okay, so the term virgin birth in Hebrew was there long before the concept of virgin birth in Christianity. Mm -hmm. I mean, virgin birth was a, was a known term. They made, the, 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 they created the definition of virgin birth to be something that it wasn't in the Jewish world. So, so you're saying that the concept of immaculate conception was was made up later? It was brought about later. Yes. And yes. they still call call her the Virgin Mary. Because they, still of call that. Her the, they call her the Virgin Mary, yes. Yes. I mean I mean it, it it from a from a faith remember from a faith perspective, you know, if you're a believer and you believe it doesn't necessarily have to be logical. It doesn't have to make, quote, logical sense. 
if you're a scientist, on the other hand, um, you need a, a little greater definition to the terminology as to exactly what immaculate conception is is all about. I mean, if you read, if you read, there's a there's a wonderful book called um, it's called um, Jesus of Nazareth, and I can't think of the author's name. Um, um, I mean, for example, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. If if you if you're if you're interested, I know we're over time, but but I'll give you an, I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. When we when when most Christians are so we're coming up to Christmas, okay, and and we come up to Christmas and they have you look around and there are nativity scenes with the manger and. This is supposedly supposed to take place where? In Bethlehem, in Beit Lechem. Um, now, the problem with that, that it takes place in Bethlehem, is the following. Jesus is only known in two ways in the, in the New Testament. He's either called Jesus of Nazareth. He's not called Jesus of Bethlehem. He's never referred to as Jesus of Bethlehem. He's only referred to as Jesus of Nazareth. And the other way he is known in the New Testament is he is called the Galilean. Now, the, both of those terms, Nazareth and Galilee, are in the northern part of Israel. Bethlehem is fairly far south. It's south of Jerusalem. It's southwest of Jerusalem. Okay, so it's fairly far south. So there had to be a reason why they needed to put Jesus in Bethlehem. Okay, first of all, it's doubtful. Most, if you read most Christian scholars, most Christian scholars will tell you right out that Jesus never set foot in Bethlehem. He never, there was no reason for him to go that far south, okay? It's doubtful that he ever went to Bethlehem. So why Bethlehem? Why is Bethlehem so important to the writers of the New Testament? Because who came from Bethlehem? Anyone remember? Okay, I'll tell you. King David. King David. King David comes from Bethlehem. And the Messiah is supposed to come from the line of King David. So another a way of putting Jesus in the line of David is to make him be born in Bethlehem the same as David was born in Bethlehem. At least there's a connection. There's no connection from Jesus to David if he's in the north, if he's in Nazareth, or if he's a Galilean. There's no connection whatsoever. So in order to make that connection, the early gospel writers place his birth in Bethlehem. And that's the only reason that Bethlehem is regaled as the birthplace of Jesus, because it's the birthplace of David. Rabbi. So that's, that is what I'm talking about in terms of that early Hebrew Christians did whatever they wanted to do to develop a line of thinking that gave Jesus credibility that didn't necessarily meet the historicity test. Rabbi, I want to uh, correct a possible misconception, which I know a lot of Jews have, concerning the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception has nothing to do with Jesus. Right. The Immaculate exactly. Conception is the fact that Mary 
was born without original sin. Right. That's the Immaculate Conception. Not it's got nothing to do with Jesus. Right. Immaculate Conception is is not. I mean, it's a lot of Christians place it on Jesus that he was born, you know, without any kind of sexual intercourse. That they look at as Immaculate Conception, but that's not the concept of Immaculate Conception. Immaculate Conception. Um, you're right, uh, Charles. Uh, only deals with Mary and the fact that she was born, supposedly she was born without, she came into the world not through sin, as everybody else comes into the world through sin. And that sin, of course, was it parth- is sexual. <clears throat> was it parthenogenesis? Was it what? Parthenogenesis? Well, I'm, I'm not, I, is, you better go no. without... No, Anne was her mother. An organism can reproduce without a partner. Oh, no. It happened. No, no, no th- th- that's so not... What, what's the explanation? What is the explanation that they give for that, that miracle yeah. happens? Was it a miracle? This was, this, was a mir- this was considered a miracle of God, yes. It was considered a miracle of God. You know, did it take place? Did it actually happen? We don't know. The other thing, the other thing, you know, I, I think you need to ask yourself the following question. When you read, well, both when you read the Old Testament and when you read the New Testament, okay? And this is the question you need to ask yourself in order to try to understand what's written there. What exactly is the Old Testament and the new to, or or the new testament trying to do is the old testament and the new testament trying to push the concept of faith or is the old testament and the new testament trying to push the concept of history which one comes to the fore when you read the old testament what were the right what was in the writers minds remember if you're going to take this on faith, this was all written by God. But if you're not going to take it on faith, if you're going to look at it from a from a, a more liberal point of view, when the Old Testament was written, what did the Old Testament authors have in mind? Were they trying to to um, uh, congeal faith within the people? Or were they trying to give us a written history of what happened in the past? I don't think I don't think you can do both. I think there are times when faith and history are so wrapped up in each other that it's almost impossible to separate them. But I think that if you read the texts, That's both the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you read them carefully, you'll be able to, and you ask yourself the right questions, you'll be able to ascertain what the authors were trying to get across, what they were trying to develop there, okay? In in most scholars' opinion, the, the authors of the, Bible of the New Testament were trying to push or develop or redevelop a new faith. That's what they were trying to do. That's what was in their minds and that's what was in their hearts. They tried to bring about a new faith, something that was different than Judaism, what they were running away from, what they were moving, what they were moving away from. They weren't so interested in being precisely historic. So when they use terms and when they use ideas and they use concepts, it's not necessarily that they actually happened. It's more necessarily what they mean to the faith of the person who's reading them. Uh, am I on? Yes. Is the Old Testament used? We have a friend, Shelley. Is the Shelley Old Testament used? 
What? Shelley Moore. Is the Old Shelley Testament Moore. used as a history book? Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. You want to say something, raise your hand. Shelly had her hands up, so anybody else who wants to talk, raise your hands and we'll try to acknowledge you. Thank you. Okay. I was just, you know, Scott, when you asked that question, um, in my head, I was saying to myself, every, every one of the three major religions has some, some kind of story that involves the supernatural possibilities um, and to me, the traditional Jews who believe in the raising of the dead, um, you know, how do we explain that through science? Well, obviously we can't. So, um, you know, I think, I think that there is this, this line of supernatural events to create awe in, in, in the people back in the old days and, and today um, it exists for some people, I guess, if you believe and if you have faith. But to there, me, there, there are people, Shelley, just let me yeah. just to jump in. Yeah. There are Jews today who go to sleep every night with a new set of clothes laid out at the end of their bed. Right. I've heard that. With the, I've idea, heard that. With the idea that the Messiah is coming tonight and right. I need to be ready. Right. Hmm. But it, it, it's such a it's such a strange and bizarre um, idea that, you know, the dead will come out of their graves and you're you can't be cremated because you need your body intact. Well, we all know your body's not going to be intact if you've been laying in the ground for 200 years. But anyway, I just wanted to say that I think in every religion, there's sort of a I'll call it a crazy idea that people just have to accept on faith and and for the faith the people who believe it it's not so crazy for us in modernity it sounds pretty weird but yeah I, shelly i think it's a leap of faith that you're discussing and in right. each of the religions there are certain concepts for which i'm look i'm looking for rational answers you know right. medical scientific answers and they don't exist for some don't. of these questions because they require a leap of faith Right. for things that have been described that I can't explain scientifically. Right. Um, Rabbi, I wanted to ask about what you talked about the early Hebrew Christians and the and what they were trying to get away from. What was it about Judaism at the time that made them look for something else? What were they unhappy with? They were unhappy with the rabbinate. They were on, mm -hmm. they were they were unhappy with the power that the rabbis had. Um, they wanted, they wanted authority spread more evenly and equally among the populace. Um, they didn't want the rabbis to have all of the power that they that they were they, that they were enjoying. Um, they also felt they also felt that that many of much of the much of the the um, the tax that was going to the temple, okay? Um, when I say tax, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about tithes that they would bring to the temple went directly to the rabbis. It didn't go to benefit anybody else. And they were, they were pretty angry about that. So they were, they were, um, they were uh, disenchanted in their, their leadership and they were looking for something different they were looking for something that was more equivocal um, and yeah look what happened with the development of the papacy you know and and talk about power oh, yeah yeah yep yep that's true that's true but the papacy came about but the papacy came about much later is anybody else having trouble relating this to life i mean how well, it, it, when you say when you say relating it to life again, you 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 either either you believe or you look at this in more of an allegorical way. I mean, Reform Judaism, Liberal Judaism tends to look at it in a much more allegorical kind of way than a literal way. Hasidim. Uh, Haredim, Orthodox Jews, traditional Jews. I mean, when they when when they pray the Amidah 
and they come to the prayer that looks forward to the rebuilding of the third temple, they're looking forward, they're actually looking forward to the rebuilding of a temple with all that that entails. It's not just a building. It's resetting up the priesthood. It's sacrificing again. It's it's everything that the and and they want to go back to that time because that's what they believe God wants. That's what they th think God is asking of them to return to days of old. Sounds yes. like the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> There are extremes in all religions. Yeah. Excuse me? Are there are extremes in, in all oh, religions? Oh, yeah. No question. No question. I, but but remember, liberal Judaism, you know, I, I wanted you to understand what Mashiach was all about. But I also want you to understand that Mashiach, Messiah, is not literal in, in liberal Judaism. It's it's a it's a period of time that we're working towards or that we're hoping to bring about by our actions and by our, our uh, prayers. We're hoping to bring about this time period that will, that will come when, when everyone will acknowledge God. You know, you pray, if you, if you go back to the Alenu, you know, you, you pray the Hebrew, but many of you don't read the English. You know, the, the Alenu is a prayer for the Messiah. It's the idea in the third paragraph of the Alenu that uh, we look forward to a time when every, when every knee will bend, every tongue will swear loyalty to God. Okay, that's, that's pretty, that says it all, that that's the time we're looking forward to going back to, when everyone will be loyal to one God. We'd say it every single Shabbat, every single week. That's why in a lot of reform synagogues, they do it in English and they've altered the words. That's why in the Amidah, when we pray the Amidah, I, I, I've said to you before that, that when you pray the Amidah, you're praying a reform version of the Amidah. We do not pray the traditional version because in the traditional version, it talks about reviving the dead. And we don't believe that. We don't believe in reviving the dead, so we don't use the traditional words. We don't use the words mechaye metim, who revives the dead. We, we, we use the words mechaye hakol, who gives forth eternal life. Okay, so we, we, if, you, if you were to take a prayer book and line them up side by side and look at them prayer for prayer, you'd find that many of the reform prayers are written in a way so that they make a little more, they're a little more adaptable to modern sensibility and to modern understanding of life. Fran had a question. Yes. Yeah, I wondered, talking about the Old Testament historically, do they in Israel, do the schools use that as a history? Um, book. I mean, do they? I mean, do they study the Old Testament as history? As history? No, no. They do study Bible. They do study Tanakh. Um, but but no, they do not study it as history. They 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 have a regular history curriculum, but no, they they don't. They 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 have, the day of the Israeli school is divided. Half half of the day is is secular subjects. Half of the day is Jewish subjects. Um, um, but but the the history comes under the secular subjects. A tour guide once told me that that's uh, they're yeah. supposed to know everything. Okay, I think uh, Rabbi, I think you've covered a lot of ground tonight. <laughs> Yeah. I love the questions. I think the questions are wonderful. And the, inter the interesting thing is we had 13 participating participants starting this evening, and we still have 13 par no. participants no. on Zoom. Sure. So I think that says something for uh, uh, what we did tonight. So I'm going gonna, gonna to end Very our...
Thank you for coming, you. everybody. I really appreciate you being Thank here. You, we'll Thank, you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Look forward Learned to seeing you. Thank you.